up and I won't know until I check back on Facebook. So hopefully it's going and we're gonna get started. So uh, thank you everybody for joining me. We're gonna talk about transformer basics today, uh, a little bit of theory as well as some NEC requirements for overcurrent protection and sizing transformers. Uh, I think a lot of you guys know me. My name is Ryan Jackson. Uh, Ryan Jackson Electrical Training is my business. I teach seminars, write textbooks, uh, consult, expert witness work, things like that. My website, ryanjacksonelectrical.com, and my email address right there, ryanjackson618 at gmail.com. If you want to get in touch with me, please don't hesitate. I'd, uh, I'd love to help you out. If you have a code question or anything, uh, please get in touch with me and, uh, and we'll see what we can do. I usually like to start with definitions whenever I'm doing a discussion and the word transformer is not defined in the NEC in a general per in a general sense it's not defined in article 100 but it is defined in article 450 and article 450 of course is the article that covers transformers but the definition is is rather unusual it, it's an individual transformer single phase or multiple phase that has a single nameplate Okay, well, if you don't know what a transformer is, that definition doesn't help. Because in order to know what a transformer is, you have to know what a transformer is. Right? I mean, <laughs> what's a transformer? Well, it's a transformer. Oh, okay. Well, well, again, what's a transformer? Well, it's probably a closer definition if we go to Article 100 and we look at the definition of what's called a separately derived system. And in Article 100, that is a power source that is not a service, so it's not a utility, and it has no direct connection to circuit conductors from another system, other than through grounding and bonding connections or through the earth itself. So the concept here is magnetic induction. Here on the left we have the primary, and here on the right we have the secondary. And the way it works is we energize a coil of wire on the left, and that induces a voltage and a current on the coil on the right. So it's rather strange. There's no direct electrical connection. So it is a separately derived system. Now, I've got a transformer here that I built several years ago, and I've got a ton of mileage out of this, and it's just it's one of my favorite things that I've ever made. Uh, as we can see, it's just a 500-foot spool of 12-gauge THWN. And what I've done is I took the, the, end of the, the end of it and the other end of it. So the first inch and the last inch. And I connected one to the hot on a cord and the other to the neutral on a cord. So it, it's just a direct short circuit. Really, you know what it is? It's like taking this full wire and just sticking it right in an outlet. That's what it is. It, it's a pretty much a direct short circuit. And that's what a transformer really is. So this is what we're going to call the primary. And we're going to in, we're going to energize this, and that will induce voltage on the secondary. And as you can see, there's no connection whatsoever. Now on the secondary, it's the exact same concept. If we can look back at the graphic, it's really on the primary here. I've got the hot and the neutral plugged in at 120 volts. And then on the secondary, in my little transformer, I've got one end of it connected to my lamp holder and the other end connected to the other end of the lamp holder. So if I turn it on, you should see that that light bulb will glow ever so slightly. You can probably barely see it when I do it right there. Now that's because this is not a particularly efficient machine. It, it's two coils of wire and, and some twist on wire connectors and electrical tape. You know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's nothing fancy, obviously. So it's not that efficient. The lamp barely, barely turns on and you probably have to squint to see it. If I do that, what I've done is I've added what's called an iron core and I make it a lot more efficient. So the concept here is magnetic induction or mutual induction. Again, I energize the primary and that induces a voltage onto the secondary. If you ever decide to do this and, and build one of these, I, it's a great learning opportunity and we're going to measure voltage in different things and, and figure out exactly how you can use it both to learn and to teach. One of the things you're going to find out immediately 
is just how strong that transformer actually is. It sucks this thing right out of your hands. And you can't leave it on for very long. Uh, this is warm. It's not hot yet, but it is warm. And as I go through this, it'll, it'll get hot if I'm not really careful. So that's just the concept. That's how a transformer works, just from the fundamental concept. So again, it's a power source that's not a service. It's not a utility. And it has no direct connection to circuit conductors of another system done through mutual induction. That concept holds true. Whether we're talking about a tiny transformer like this doorbell transformer and in the land of the National Electrical Code we call that a class 2 transformer or maybe a class 3 transformer and this is like a hundred watts. Very small transformer but it's the same concept. 120 volts in and the output is whatever we choose. 12 volts, 24 volts, I think up to 30 volts. Not much. It's the same concept for a large transformer. This is a this is a transformer at the power plant where I teach and I'm gonna check the Facebook feed just to make sure nothing's broken here but take a look at the nameplate on that and just uh, and just tell me if the uh, <laughs> tell me if the if the numbers on that make sense I mean to me they're so the, when I when I first saw this I I literally didn't even understand what I was looking at the numbers of it. It's like, okay, voltage 26,000. Yeah, that's not really my world, but okay, I know there's such a thing as 26,000. But what is this absurd number? 968,800 kVA. So can we just, can we call that a million kVA? Can we just round it? So a billion watts. This doorbell transformer is a hundred watts. That is a billion with a B watts. But it's the same concept, right? It's all the same concept when it comes to transformers. If I have these transformers here that are typically pole mounted, uh, it's the same concept uh, there as well. Inside of each of these tubs, we essentially have one of these. Now, it's side by side in that transformer tub, but that, that doesn't matter. It could just as easily be on top of each other like that. Right? So it's the same concept. It's done through mutual induction. And inside of a little transformer like this, same concept, right? It's all done through magnetic induction. Now, there is one exception to that, and I saw somebody on the chat asking if I was going to hit on this, and the answer is yes. There is one exception, uh, and that's what we call an auto transformer or in the field what we call a buck and boost transformer. And a buck and boost transformer doesn't quite work the same way as a normal transformer. And really the symbol for it is, is beautiful. It, it tells you exactly what we're doing. So if I have on my primary, I have a 240 volt coil. Instead of actually having a secondary and creating or deriving a secondary voltage, Instead of doing that, what I do is I actually connect right to the primary. So instead of connecting to each end of the primary and just getting, you know, 240 volts, I connect to one end and then I connect to like three quarters of the way through it, right? So like with these coils, if I had a thousand foot long coil, I'd connect to the end of it. And instead of connecting to the other end, I would connect like three quarters of the way through it at like the 750 foot mark. And that would give me 75% of the voltage. So instead of getting 240, I could get 208. So that is kind of the concept of an auto transformer or a buck and boost transformer. Uh, again, they're not particularly common, but when you need it, you need it. And, and they're a nice solution. Usually, you use them to increase or decrease voltage by a maximum of like 5%. Uh, that's not a hard and fast rule. You can get them to, to substantially increase or decrease voltage, but that's kind of the general concept is about 5%. Okay, so let's talk about the secondary voltage. The derived voltage or the secondary voltage is determined by the ratio of the number of windings on the primary to the number of windings on the secondary, and this is also known as the turns ratio. 
Now this does not include the internal inefficiencies of the transformer and my transformer of course is very inefficient because it's something I made in my garage. <laughs> you know, you go to the store, you're not going to get, you know, you're going to get a better transformer. So if I had a primary of 480 and a secondary of 120, then that means the turns ratio, the number of windings on the primary is 4 and the number of turns on the secondary is 1 or 400 and 100, right? Or 800 and 200, but a 4 to 1 ratio. If I went from 480 to 240, then of course that would be a 2 to 1 ratio. Or if I went from 240 to 120, that also would be a 2 to 1 ratio. And if I wanted to actually not change the voltage, but actually go from 480 to 480, uh, I would do that in a 1 to 1 ratio. And we call that an isolation transformer. We can, we can create a new system without wanting a new voltage. And it's not particularly common that we do that, but there's definitely applications where you would use that. So looking at the picture here, and I'll make that a little bit bigger. This is what? This is a two to one transformer, right? A two to one turns ratio because I have a 480 primary and a 240 secondary. And what that means, let's start with the secondary. For every one of these, there are two of these, right? So from the primary to the secondary, it's a two to one turns ratio. Pretty simple concept, right? The turns ratio. Later on, if you stick with me long enough, we're gonna talk about what's called voltage ratio. And that's something that, uh, that we use when we're sizing secondary conductors, when we're protecting secondary conductors in uh, 240.21C. Voltage ratio and turns ratio are not the same thing. I know we haven't touched on voltage ratio yet, but it's easy to look at that and say, well, the voltage ratio is two to one, the turns ratio is two to one. Well, yes, in that application, that's correct. But the turns ratio and the voltage ratio aren't necessarily the same thing. And that gets more into like three phase transformers. Okay, so let's look at the secondary voltage. We're going to uh, come over here to the widescreen, get my meter out here. Had this meter a long time now. So we're going to turn it on to voltage. And first, let's measure the voltage on the primary, just so we can kind of have that as a baseline. I'm going to set that up to read the maximum. And first, I'm going to turn it on like any smart electrician would. And uh, <laughs> 122, um, we're going to be doing some rounding. Can I just call that 120? Fair enough. So I got 120 on the primary. What are we going to have on the secondary when we turn this on? Uh, take this out. I'm going to take out my iron core, by the way, and see what the voltage on the secondary is. All right, see how many hands I can use here. All right, let's do it. We get about 20 volts. Not a particularly efficient transformer, is it? This is a one-to-one -one transformer, right? Obviously, we have the same number of turns. I mean, you know, I just went to Lowe's or Home Depot and grabbed a couple spools of wire. So it's the same number of turns. This is a one-to-one -one transformer. I should have 122 volts in and 122 volts out, but I don't have anything near 120 volts out. I only had about 20 volts out. So what's the deal? Is the turns ratio thing a myth? No, turns ratio is a fact, <laughs> right? Um, I got about 20 volts with an air core in my transformer. So we'll just kind of write that number down and stick it aside. Let's try this with an iron core transformer. You remember when we first turned it on, the, the lamp burned significantly brighter when I had an iron core in it. So let's take a look and see what the voltage is. Turn that on to the max and forty-two volts. So let's call it forty volts. So I went from 20 volts to 40 volts by putting in 
an iron core. So could we say that we increased the efficiency of about 100%, right? We doubled the efficiency of this transformer. So now we get 120 volts in and about 40 volts out. Again, because it's a transformer that we built in the garage. If you look at a real transformer and you look at the nameplate, the efficiency of a transformer is is truly amazing considering what it is. I mean, let's not lose sight of the fact that a transformer has an, an air gap, you know? I mean, there, there is no connection here. So to have any kind of efficiency at all is quite remarkable. And real transformers have an efficiency of somewhere between like 95 and 98%, actually even higher, 95 to 99% efficiency. So it's, it's quite amazing that we're able to do that. Let's talk about the current the primary current on the transformer, and this is where I think it kind of gets interesting. Primary current is a function of Ohm's law, right? So current equals voltage divided by impedance, or I equals E over Z. Now, when it comes to actually measuring a transformer, a transformer is essentially a short circuit, but with a ton of inductive reactants. Okay, so Let's measure the current on this transformer here. I'm gonna turn this on just because I, I, I like having the lamp on there. And get my meter, turn it to current, hit that max button, clamp it around either one of my conductors, right? The hot or the neutral doesn't matter because the, those terms are kind of meaningless, you know, when you really think about it, it's all just a short circuit. So let's turn that on. and we get 27.6 amps. That's actually a little bit lower than I was expecting. Usually I get, yeah, 29.9. So let's go ahead and call that 30 amps. Fair enough? So how do I figure the resistance and the current and everything on my transformer? Well. We know that this is 500 feet of 12 gauge THWN. We can use the code book. We go into table eight in chapter nine and we look under the size of conductor. We go over here to 12 gauge. We go over here to copper, uncoated, which by the way, uncoated copper means it's not tinned copper. So uncoated ohms per thousand feet is 1.93. Can we just call that two ohms? Fair enough. So two ohms per thousand feet. I've got a 500 foot spool, so that means that it's one ohm of resistance. Ohm's law says that 120 volts, and we had 122, we're gonna call it 120. 120 volts divided by one ohm should be 120 amps. Well, we didn't have 120 amps, we had 30 amps. So what's going on? Is Ohm's law a myth? <laughs> or is there something that we're, that we're not quite understanding yet? Well, it's important to remember that with an alternating current system, which is what we're dealing with, we have not only resistance, but we have reactance as well. And that is the total impedance. So the impedance is the combination of the resistance and the reactants, capacitive reactants and inductive reactants. Now, for the purposes of our discussion, capacitive reactants is, is negligible, so it's, it's basically inductive reactants. And what that is, is the length and the frequency, 60 hertz, but most importantly, the shape, the fact that it's a coil. That puts a huge amount of inductive reactants onto the circuit. Now, when I typed this up, uh, I typed it under some assumptions. I wrote, if the primary voltage is 120 volts and the current is about 40, then that means the impedance is about three ohms. Now, fortunately, we can do this math pretty easily. We didn't have 40 amps, we had 30. Fine, that means it's four ohms, right? It's actually even better for the purposes of our discussion. That means the primary winding is one ohm of resistance. We know that, right? The resistance is a physical property. We, we can't change that. 500 feet is one ohm. 
I don't care if you tie it in a knot, tie it in a bow, it's one ohm of resistance. But the coil is reactance. So we have a total of three ohms or four ohms of impedance. Does that make sense? I'm going to open up the chat screen here on Facebook and I'm just going to see if we have any kind of comments. Brandon, are you touching on auto transformers? Yes. Do I have any more comments? No. All right. Everybody's quiet, so I'm guessing uh, I'm guessing that either it's awesome or it stopped working an hour ago and nobody can hear anything that I'm saying. So hopefully it's not the second one. <laughs> Let's keep going. Why doesn't the breaker trip? Uh, here I'm I'm in my house. Right, I would love to tell you that I'm in this massive office that says Ryan Jackson on the side of it, and it's 100 stories tall, but let's not kid each other. I'm in my house. I'm on a 20 amp breaker, and I just put 30 amps going through this circuit. Let's try this one more time. Let's hit the maximum current here. Yeah, 30 amps, 28.6. Twenty-eight point six. So before I was getting about forty. Now I'm getting thirty. That's fine. It's not, you know, I, I might have had instead of my ratchet, might have had my screwdriver. That's not uh, obviously doesn't have quite the same mass. So let's see what that does. By the way, this would be less of an iron core. So it's not going to be as good as a. I don't want to say a conductor, but it, it won't. Uh, it won't aid in magnetic induction. It won't cut through the lines of flux quite as easily. So if we use a lesser core, oh, there we go. It's about, oh, I want to hit the max. 46 amps. So 30 amps, 40 amps. Either way, the question remains, why didn't I have to go down and reset my breaker? I mean, I'm in my house, right? I didn't plug that. This isn't, <laughs> I didn't just wire this onto the utility conductors. It's on a 20 amp circuit. Why didn't the breaker trip? Well, it will eventually. If I, if I let it trip, it, it will. If I just keep this thing plugged in and I just go and make myself a sandwich or something, I'm gonna come back to a dark room. You know, it, it will trip eventually. According to UL489, and this is something that a lot of people have a hard time understanding. There's this just magic, mythical 80% number that nobody is willing to let go of. But according to UL489, a circuit breaker is not allowed to trip at 100% of its current rating. Now, this is your typical uh, molded case circuit breaker, right? The kind that we have in our house, the kind that you have in your office building. It might not be an instantaneous trip circuit breaker like you have in a motor controller. But, you know, we're, we're talking just real-world stuff for a minute. A 20-amp breaker will hold 20 amps forever. It's required to. It's not allowed to trip. At 135% of its rating, it has to trip within an hour if the circuit breaker is rated 50 amps or less. And that's what we have here, 20-amp breaker. So if I left this thing plugged in and went and had a sandwich, it would trip. But how fast? At 200%, and we just saw 40 amps, 20 amp breaker, at 200%, it has to trip within two minutes if it's a 30 amp or smaller circuit breaker. So this is a 20 amp breaker. When I turn this thing on, um, I turn it right back off because it's gonna trip within two minutes. Uh, within two seconds, 20 seconds, two minutes, I don't know. I'm not willing to find out. <laughs> <laughs> I have trip breakers before in commercial buildings where I've taught classes and uh, let me tell you that sucks uh, if you're an instructor always 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 know where the circuit breakers are before you start using the transformer as a teaching tool this is what we call an inverse time current curve and pretty much every circuit breaker or fuse uh, has one of these and I know it's a little bit hard to see so let me make it a little bit bigger but the concept is uh, time goes from, let's see, there you go. Time goes from uh, down to up and current from left to right on this curve. Do you see these two arcs right here? 
this short one here is the fastest that the breaker fuse will open. And this other curve here is the slowest that it would open. So this is for a 100 amp breaker. And right here on the very bottom of your screen, if you can even see it, you might see the number one. That means one times the rating. So if it's a 100 amp breaker, one times the rating is 100 amps. And what this is saying is how fast will it trip? Well, it won't. It will hold forever because it has to. But if I put 10 times the rating, so 1,000 amps, right, on a 100 amp breaker, if I put 10 times the rating, it will trip somewhere between, I don't know, 0 0.8 seconds and 5 seconds. If I were to put 100 times the rating, so 10,000 amps, how fast will it trip? Well, so fast that it's basically almost immeasurable. We're, we're measuring it not in seconds, but in you know milliseconds, in cycles, or quarter cycle. So that's kind of the concept. So why didn't my 40 amp breaker trip? Well, because I only subjected it to two times its rating, which is somewhere, let's say right here. So that might trip at what? 30 seconds to two minutes? somewhere around there. So yes, it will trip, but it won't trip immediately. Let's keep going. This is something kind of, uh, kind of fun, like a little bonus here. Electromagnetism. Removing the iron core while the transformer is off will magnetize the core. Okay, let's do this. Go back to this. And there's my screwdriver. And got a paper clip, there you go. If, however, I remove it while the transformer is on, it demagnetizes the screwdriver. So, handy thing to have in your garage or on the job site. You know, so once again, turn it on, turn it off, magnet, pull it out while it's under load, and it demagnetizes. So, you can imagine that pretty much every tool that I own is all magnetized in my garage just because you know I kind of like playing around with this thing let me just quickly check on Facebook once again and see if anybody has any questions I'm looking at the wrong video <laughs> All right, I got, whoa, hey, how you doing? I'm in school, teaching, now works great, awesome. Stopped working. I hope it didn't stop working. Nobody else said it stopped working, so good. Good, good, good. You're late, am I touching on auto transformers? Awesome, sweet, fixed, perfect, love it. Okay, I think we're good. Hey, John, Shane, Peyton, how you doing? Jim? All right, good, 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 glad to hear it. So, uh, system grounding. When it comes to transformers, we can do all sorts of different things with transformers depending on how we ground the secondary. Um, that is a little bit, that, that really is a subject all on its own. And I could easily spend a couple of hours on it, uh, but I already have. And I did that on a video that's on my YouTube channel called NEC System Grounding. If you're interested in that, uh, take a look at the video and we go over all sorts of different grounding configurations. The most common, of course, is what we call a solidly grounded system. Um, with my transformer here, I have on the secondary, I have what we would call a single voltage secondary. Because the only two points that I can possibly measure are at the ends of the spool, right? And as we know, I get about, uh, what was it, 40 volts. If I have the iron core going through it, we get about 40 volts. But what if I wanted to create a system where I have more options, where I have more than just one voltage? Could I do that with this spool of wire? Sure. You know what I would do? I would unspool this. I'd, I'd roll it out, unspool it, and I would measure it out, and at the 250 foot mark, the very center, I would like put some tape on it or something, right? I, I would strip it down and I'd make a little splice and then I'd spool it all back up 
and at the center, I would take a third wire and we would call that a neutral conductor or a ground dead conductor and we would connect it to the dirt and that is essentially the transformer that supplies your house, right? That's a single phase, three wire, solidly grounded system, probably, not even probably, without question, the most common voltage system in the United States. So a three wire, uh, single phase, solidly grounded system. So we could do that with this machine that we created here. Uh, I'm not particularly interested in doing it, but we could if we wanted to. So that's how we get multiple voltages. Um, it's important too, and this is kind of a conceptual thing, that this is a single phase transformer, but all transformers are single phase trans. There, there is no three phase transformer. Okay, a three phase transformer is not a thing. It's three things. It's three single phase transformers wired together in a particular configuration. Right. So it's three single phase transformers connected in a Y, or three single phase transformers connected in a delta. But there is no single phase, you know, there is no three phase transformer. It, it's a three phase transformer is a box with three transformers in it. Let's get into some code rules here. And here's where we're going to start talking about circuit sizing and protecting the transformer from melting. Here's some NEC basics for transformers. Uh, this is a concept that people really tend to struggle with. Article 450 protects a transformer from overcurrent. That's all Article 450 does as it relates to overcurrent protection. It protects the windings. It doesn't protect the primary conductors. It doesn't protect the secondary conductors. It protects the transformer itself, and that's all it does. Article 240 protects the conductors from overcurrent. Now, the primary is easy. Uh, there's nothing special about protecting transformer primary conductors from overcurrent but it gets a little bit more involved when it comes to protecting secondary conductors from overcurrents. I have no idea why that just popped up. So the first thing we have to do is talk about mathematics for transformers. So current is what we're trying to do. Now transformers, of course, don't have like a current rating per se. They have a power rating, KVA. I need to figure out what the current is. So current equals KVA divided by voltage. I equals KVA over E. So here I've got a 25 kVA, and the high voltage side is 480. So I'm going to take 25,000 volt amps divided by 480, and that gives me 52 amps on that side, which might be the primary, might be the secondary. It depends on whether we're stepping up or stepping down. If I'm wiring the secondary at 240, then I would take my 25,000 divided by 240, and that gives me 104 amps. I want to check the... Facebook stream one more time just because that weird little glitch that just happened. I want to make sure that everything is still going. Yes, it is. Awesome. Good. Okay, perfect. Good, good, good. Can I show the transformer connection again? Yeah, absolutely. One second here. Awesome. Looks good. Great. No questions. Perfect. So glad that it's working. I really didn't know if it was going to. Um, can I show my transformer connection again? Absolutely. All it is, Mike, is I take a spool of wire, 500 foot of 12 gauge, and I take the end of it, and I take the other end of it, right? The, the start of the spool and the end of the spool. I kind of dig in there and, you know, get the start of it out, strip it, and then I take a cord, and all I did is I have the hot side or, or the negative, you know, the, the hot or neutral. Again, those are meaningless terms for this discussion. I take one end of the cord and I connect it to one end of the coil of wire. I take the other end and I connect it to the other end of the coil of wire. So the hot goes to the start of the roll and the neutral goes to the end of the roll, right? So it's just, it's just a flat out short circuit. That's what it is, right? It's like taking the first inch and the last inch and just plugging it right into the socket. Other than the fact that it's in a big coil, which is why it doesn't blow up. On the secondary, same concept. I take the end of the spool and I take the start of the spool. 
and I just connect one end to the hot on a lamp and the other end to the neutral on a lamp. And that's it, that's the, that's the connection. Um, and then for my core, use whatever big gnarly chunk of, uh, chunk of iron that you can find. Rebar works really well. Like I said, a good half inch drive ratchet works really well. Um, you can use little screwdrivers. You know, I had this little guy before. You can magnetize it, you can use it for a core. It just won't be quite as efficient. Let me go back, check some more questions. Uh, Shane says, I'd love to see you do this with larger wire, like eight gauge or something. What difference would that make? Um, well, that would decrease the resistance, which means the current would go up, right? Um, by the way, if you're an instructor, do this with like a 500 foot spool like we have here, and then also do it with a thousand foot spool. Make it a two to one turns ratio instead of a one to one transformer. Uh, remind the folks about grounded and grounding the difference of wording. Um, well, yeah, grounded conductor is essentially a neutral, right? Grounded conductors are white, grounding conductors are green. Uh, Ron, since you're setting the current measurement for max, can you clamp after, oh, okay, yeah. So hit that after the inrush. Okay, so I'll turn it on for a minute and then I will measure the current. Great point, Ron. Um, so hopefully the breaker doesn't trip. I don't know if you guys can see the measurement or not. Maybe you can. I don't go there, turn it off. I can't go any longer than that. <laughs> but it was 43. Um, it, it didn't change. So, yeah, well, it, it, I didn't, uh, I don't know how long it takes a, a transformer to saturate, but for a small one like this, I, I don't think it's very long. So I don't, I don't know that there's, I think the inrush might have been fast enough that we didn't even see it, to be honest, Ron, uh, fast enough that my, that my meter didn't measure it, so. Okay, no more uh, comments so far, it looks like. So let's keep rolling. Move that down. Okay. Change that screen. Get a drink of water. All right, transform math. Current equals KVA over voltage. When it comes to three phase, however, we have to deal with the square root of three. Um, voltage is defined as the difference in potential between two points. Now forget the word potential and don't, don't get carried away. Here's the bottom line. I only have two leads on my tester. I cannot measure voltage between three objects simultaneously, right? It, it doesn't work because voltage is the difference between two objects. So what's the voltage between phase A to phase B to phase C? Well, you have to do that vectorally, mathematically. And the easy way to say that is that we use the square root of three. So here I've got a three phase 225 kVA transformer. So I'm going to take my 225,000 divided by my primary voltage, which is 480, but because it's three phase, I have to take my, my primary voltage times the square root of three. And there's two numbers that I think are worth memorizing. 831 is the value of 480 times the square root of three. Uh, that number, 831, I have never regretted in my life memorizing that number. 831 is a number I've done. And by the way, I was an inspector for 16 years. I sized every single transformer that I ever inspected because that's how you get good at it. You know what I mean? So I can. I, I got to the point where I didn't need a book. I could just rattle it right out because, you know, it's like that old joke. You know, the musician gets in the cab in New York and he says, hey, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And the cab driver says, practice, man. Practice, practice, practice. How do you get good at doing transformers? You got to do them. You got to do the math, you know? So 480 times square root of three, 225,000 divided by 831 means I have 271 amps on the primary. 
on the secondary side, same concept, 225,000 divided by what? 208 times the square root of 3. Here's another number that's worth memorizing, and this one's even easier. 360. 208 times the square root of 3 is 360. So 225,000 divided by 360 is 625 amps. So on the primary of this transformer, I have 271 amps. Secondary, I have 625 amps. Or, if you don't like this whole 3 square root of 3 nonsense, you don't have to use it. Do you remember what I said earlier? There are no three-phase transformers. That, that, that's no, there's no such thing, right? What I really have, take a look at this one. Here I have a 15 kVA three-phase transformer. No, I don't. I have three 5 kVA transformers. That's what I really have, right? So instead of doing this whole square root of 3 nonsense, why don't I just say 5,000 divided by 120? Or, I could, you know, or if you want, if you don't like the easy way, you don't have to do it the easy way. You could take 15,000 divided by 208 times 1.732, and guess what that gives you? 41.6 amps. Or, just do it the easy way. Take KVA divided by 3, so 5 single phase transformers, or <laughs> 3 5 KVA single phase transformers, divide that by 120 instead of 208. Guess what the number is? Same number, 41.6 amps. This is something that I think is important to, to, to understand when it comes to high leg transformers. Um, you're limited in how much line to neutral load you can have on phase B, right? Or, or, or on phase A and C, because you, you're, it, it, the fact that you have 15 kVA doesn't mean anything. You have 5 kVA and 5 kVA and 5 kVA. If you overload any of the, you don't have 10 and 2.5 and 2.5. And you have 5, 5, and 5. If you overload any one of those three phases, you're going to have a problem. So it's important to remember that it's three single phase transformers. Let's go ahead and do some code stuff here. 450.3b, the table, this is for transformers rated right 1,000 volts and less. I'm not going to get into medium voltage. So overcurrent protection for transformers rated 1,000 volts or less must be in accordance with table 450.3b. If you're new to the code, draw a big line horizontally and vertically, like I did right there. You'll never regret that. The rules for primary protection only and secondary protection are quite different. So I never, this is something that, that people really struggle with. You don't have to use secondary protection when it comes to transformers. Because what does Article 450 do? 450 protects the transformer. Not the wires, just the transformer. Well, if the breaker supplying the transformer is sized small enough, that protects the transformer. I don't care what you do on the secondary side. The primary overcurrent device protected the whole thing, if you size it appropriately. But if you screw up, if you size the primary too big, and you violate this code rule, then ultimately what this does is it says, okay, you know what? You can take a combination of the primary and the secondary overcurrent device, if you size both of them appropriately, using those two together will, will protect the transformer windings. So the general rule is you never need secondary protection unless you screw up. But here's the thing. You're always going to have secondary protection whether you like it or not. Because what do you, why'd you put in a transformer? Well, probably to serve a panel, right? So I've got my primary feeding my transformer and then I've got my secondary coming out. Well guys, the, the panel itself, Article 408 says we have to make sure the panel doesn't melt, the guts, so we have to provide protection for the panel. And it says, look, this is 408.36. If a panel is supplied by a transformer, the overcurrent device that protects the actual guts of the panel must be on the secondary side of the transformer. All right, so in this picture, I don't see like a fuse disconnect. So that means this panel better be main breaker. Is that right? 
because that's going to protect the panel board. So in this photograph, I've obviously got a primary protection device. I mean, there, you know, something is supplying the transformer. And whether I like it or not, I happen to have secondary protection too. I just you know, don't necessarily, I didn't do it by design, but the code says you have to to protect the panel. So I've almost always got primary and secondary protection. And really, this allows you to really screw up a transformer and still comply with the code. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's hard to violate 450.3b. Let's do a couple of transformers together. This would be primary only protection. So here I've got what, a single phase 480 to 240 volt transformer. So doing the math, and I'm just gonna do this quickly and, and not do it a million times. So if you're doing this at home, you know, watch this video and then watch it again with the pause button. The primary overcurrent device must not exceed the primary current times 125%. Let's go back to that. Currents of nine amps or more, primary protection only, 125%, and then note one, which we'll talk about. So I do the math, 25,000 volt amps divided by 480 equals 52 amps times 125% plus the next size up. 52 amps times 125% is 65 amps. 65 amps is not a standard rating, standard rating of breaker. So I can go to the next size up, which is 70 amps. So 70 amps on the primary, and I'm done. I'm, I'm in the clear. I have satisfied the requirement using primary protection only. Well, what if for some reason I screwed up and all I had on my truck is like a 100 amp breaker for the primary? Can I do that? Well, let's find out. If I use the primary and secondary protection, then that means I'm down here on the bottom. For my primary, currents of 9 amps or more, I can go up to 250% of the primary current as long as my secondary is no more than 125% of that of the secondary current plus the next size up because it says right here C note 1 be really careful the next size up is only allowed where note 1 applies so it applies up here on primary protection only for currents of 9 amps or more and it applies when I'm using primary and secondary on the secondary side. So be careful on that. It's easy to, it's easy to get screwed up on that. So if I'm using primary plus secondary protection, primary device, we know that the current's 52 amps times 250%, that is 130 amps. Now, one more time. Primary and secondary, do I get to use the next size up? No. No, that 250% is a hard, fast number. It doesn't say, oh yeah, and the next size up. No, it doesn't say that. So, 52 amps. 52 amps times 250% is 130. The next size down is 125 amps. Now, if 130 amps just happened to land, if that was a standard rating, then cool, go with 130 amps, but it's not. So my choices are 125 or 150. Well, 125. The code doesn't allow me to use the next size up in this application. But on the secondary side, I've got my secondary current. 25,000 divided by 240 is 104. Multiply that by 125% plus the next size up equals 130. No such thing. Go up to the next size, 150 amps. So. That's how I would size it if I wanted to use both primary and secondary overcurrent protection. One more time, I'm going to quickly take a peek, see if anybody has questions. Great little trick, thank you. I'm not sure what your great little trick was, but I'm glad that you like it. <laughs> great thing, thank you. Still going, good stuff, good, good, good. Perfect, all right, looks like everybody's good, so let's keep on trucking. Let's do a small transformer. So for a small transformer, this is single phase, 480 to 240. The primary overcurrent device, let's go back to the table one more time. I have currents of nine amps or more, which is where we live 99% of our lives. 
But we've also got rules for small transformers, current less than 9 amps, and we have rules for itty bitty transformers, you know, less than 2 amps, but I don't think we're going to cover that. So we're going to move over here to the 9 amps, less than 9 amps column. Primary over current device must not exceed, what do we got here? Uh, 3 kVA. So 3000 divided by 480 is 6.25. So primary device must not exceed 6.25 times 167%, which equals 10 amps. The next standard rating is not allowed for primary only protection for nine amps or less. Is that right? Yeah, doesn't say C01, so we can't use that next size up. Fortunately though, the math worked out. I'm gonna put that on a 10 amp breaker and we're good to go. If we wanna do primary and secondary protection. Hey, what if I don't have any 10 amp breakers? You know, what if, I'm, what if I'm wiring this thing up and I am in Timbuktu a million miles away from a parts store. I've got a truck full of 15 amp breakers, but I don't have any 10 amp breakers or 10 amp fuses. Maybe I could use the primary and secondary protection technique to my advantage. Let's give it a shot. Primary overcurrent device must not exceed 6.25. Let's go back to the table here. Primary and secondary, right? Primary protection for less than 9 amps. 250 percent. All right, that's more than 10 amps. So, take my 6.25 times 250 percent equals 15.6 amps. Next size down because note one didn't apply. Next size down is 15 amps. Sweet. I've got a bunch of those on my truck. I don't have to go buy a 10 amp breaker and I'm not gonna and the transformer is not going to blow up. It's not going to have overcurrent. So I'm going to protect it with a 10 amp on the primary as long as I don't screw up the secondary. Secondary must not exceed the secondary current, 12.5, times 167%. That equals 20.8. Next size down is 20 amps. So my primary overcurrent device is 15 amps. My secondary overcurrent device is 20. Using those two together, I know that my transformer won't melt. So here's where using the primary plus secondary could actually be to your advantage. The thing you gotta remember about using the primary plus secondary method of protection is your primary conductors, they have to be sized based off that upstream device. So if you, you know, if we're dealing with like a real transformer, you know, a, a, I don't know, a, a 45 kV or a 112.5 kVA, you want to start putting that primary device 250%? Hey, be my guest. Hope you got some 500 KC mil to wire it with. <laughs> you know what I mean? So here, it's actually a nice benefit, but it usually isn't. But there is a place for it. Let's do a three-phase transformer together. Here we have a 225 kVA transformer. We're going to use primary only protection, which is the way we normally do it. So we know that we're going to take 225,000 divided by what? 480 times the square root of three. And we know that that number is 831 because we know that that's a number to memorize, right? Tattoo it on your arm or on your forehead or whatever you gotta do, but 831 is a great number to know. So 225,000 divided by 831 is 271 amps. We're using the primary only protection. So we're gonna take 271 amps times 125% and then go to the next size up. So we do that math. It's 330 amps, 338. Now, could I put that on a 300 amp breaker? Sure, yeah, of course you could, no problem. But you can also put it on a 350 amp breaker. That's the highest you can go using the primary only method. So again, currents of nine amps or more, primary only. If we wanted to use the primary and secondary protection, then we would take, what, that 271 amps that we found out about, multiplied by 250%, which is 677 amps. There's no such thing as a 677 amp breaker. So can I go up to 700? No, no, it didn't say note one, so I gotta go down to a 600 amp breaker. And then I have to make sure that I size the secondary overcurrent protection appropriately as well. So. My secondary current is what? 225,000 divided by 360, which is 625 amps, times 125% plus the next size up. So when I do that math, it's 780. Next size up 
800 amps, that's my secondary device. So those are the methods that the code recognizes for protecting the actual windings of the transformer. Let's take a look at how we protect the conductors for a transformer. When it comes to the primary, it's actually very, very easy. Again, you just make sure the wires don't melt. You size these the same way you'd size anything else. So on this single phase transformer that we had, and I'm gonna go through these kind of quickly, we figured out that we had 52 amps worth of current on the primary and we times that by 125% and that was a 65 amp breaker, but there's no such thing, so we used a 70 amp breaker. So that means that I need 70, 70 amp wire. If my terminals were only rated 60 degrees, doubtful, then I would have to use 4 gauge. If my terminals are rated 75 degrees, then I could use 6 gauge. So that's if I sized the transformer using the primary method of protection only. If I, for some reason, I was just dead set on using the primary plus secondary technique, well, then my primary overcurrent device was 52 amps times 250% and then next size down, which is a 125 amp breaker. Well, I would need two gauge wire. So instead of installing six gauge, I'm installing two gauge, which is fine if you're paying for it. It's not fine if I'm paying for it, right? I'm using primary only, get real, but there's options. Same concept here for a three phase primary conductors. You know, I, and I think we can probably more or less skip this. Primary protection only, we got a 350 amp breaker. You need 350 amp wire, which means what? 500 KC mil. If you're protecting this with the primary and secondary protection technique, <laughs> well, 271 amps on the primary times, what was it, 250%? is 677 amps, next size down is 600 amps, so I need a 600 amp wire. That means I'm using 1250 KC mil, come on, no I'm not, or I'm using two sets of 300 KC mil. So again, we see the difference. Using primary only, I have one set of 500 KC mil. Using primary plus secondary, I have one set of 1250, or parallel 300s, whichever way you wanna do it. So again, sizing the primary conductors is actually very easy. Protecting them is simple. There's, there's no special rules. When it comes to the secondary conductors, however, that's when we start getting into some different requirements. Um, any more comments? Looks like everybody's good. Perfect. Let's keep rolling. The first thing you got to realize in 240.21, and that's where we go to protect secondaries. 240.21C is in Charlie. The first thing to know is that the secondary conductors coming out of the transformer are not protected by the primary overcurrent device. They're not, except in one instance. For transformers with a single voltage secondary, just 240, or just, for, not, not 120, 240, not 277, 40, you know, just single voltage secondary, 240, 480. Then the secondary conductors are considered protected by the primary overcurrent device, overcurrent device, if the overcurrent device rating doesn't exceed the secondary ampacity times the secondary to primary voltage ratio. Okay, cool. If you've never done this math, it's actually not as bad as it sounds. I've got a 2 kVA transformer, which means back in 450.3B, that we were just talking about, we're in the currents of less than nine amps. Right, So we'd have to go back to that table and we figure out, okay, how do I size the primary device? Well, I went back and I did it. And ultimately, here's the deal. We're gonna use a six amp fuse, okay? So we use a six amp fuse to protect the primary on this. I'm gonna have 14 gauge sec. I'm gonna start with 14 gauge secondaries because there's no smaller conductor, right? I mean, I'm, I can't run cat five, <laughs> you know what I mean? So the smallest I can run is 14. Let's see if it works. 14 gauge secondary conductors. Okay, 14 gauge has an ampacity of 15 amps, right? So 15 amps is the secondary ampacity, and I need to take that and multiply it by the secondary to primary voltage ratio. Push pause for a minute. 
it's not the primary to secondary, it's the secondary to primary. And that gets weird because this is like the only place in the code that I know of that we do this. What if I'm going from 480 to 240? What is the secondary to, to primary ratio? 0 0.5, right? So I need to make sure that my secondary conductors, when multiplied by the secondary to primary voltage ratio, is what? 15 amps times 0 0.5 is 7.5 amps. So the secondary conductors are protected by the primary device if the primary device, 6 amps, does not exceed the secondary conductor ampacity, 15, times the secondary to primary voltage ratio. Okay, so we figured out 15 amp wire times 0 0.5 is 7.5 amps. That number needs to be bigger than the primary overcurrent device. And if it is, and if the voltage is a single voltage secondary, then cool, we don't need any sort of overcurrent protection on the secondary. This could just go straight to the load. Okay, that's the only time that you don't need secondary protection. So, doesn't come up often, but when it does, the code addresses it. In the real world, we live in the land of secondary conductors that are either up to 10 feet or that are outdoors or that are up to 25 feet. For secondary conductors up to 10 feet in length, we know that the primary device does not protect the secondary conductors. Something has to protect them and it's the breaker that they terminate to. The ampacity must be, number one, enough to carry the load. Well, yeah, <laughs> every wire has to be sized to carry the load, come on. B, not less than the rating of the overcurrent device that they terminate to. Be careful on this. Here I've got this transformer, 75 kVA, and I'm feeding a 225 amp main breaker panel, right? Because we know the panel has to have overcurrent protection, so it's got a main breaker. What this rule just said is, look, you need a 225 amp wire. Not a 220 amp wire, not a 200 amp wire, you need a full-blown, legit, 225 amp wire. You can't use any neck size up kind of voodoo when it comes to transformer secondary conductors. So they have to be sized to carry the load and not smaller than the overcurrent device that they terminate to. Uh, they must not leave the equipment that they supply. Okay, cool. So like it's less than 10 feet. I mean, you know, how far are you going to go? They have to be in a raceway, by the way, which I think is dumb. Can't be an MC cable. Seriously. And then number four, the primary overcurrent device times the primary to secondary voltage ratio, typo, must not exceed 10 times the rating of the secondary conductors. Don't get freaked out by that. I'm going to do an example, and I'll show you why that's usually nothing to concern yourself about, but that's actually going to be the last thing that we hit on tonight. So just kind of keep that in your back pocket, the whole transformer voltage ratio and 10 times and all that jazz. We'll, we'll get there. So that's my 10-foot secondary. Not that hard. Keep it less than 10 feet, put it in a pipe, and make sure that it's protected at its ampacity by the device that it supplies. Pretty simple. Outdoor secondary conductors. Hey, you know what's nice about wires that are outside? Can't burn a building down. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we, we let you do almost whatever you want. Outdoor secondary conductors are allowed without any length limitation. Well, they have to be because a lot of times we have customer-owned transformers that might look like utility poles, but they're customer-owned, and the secondary go a thousand feet. So yeah, we need to have an outdoor unlimited length secondary allowance. What are the requirements? Well, the conductors have to be protected from physical damage. Well, yeah, that's always the case. Number two, conductors have to terminate to an overcurrent device rated not higher than the conductor ampacity. So same concept. If they go to a 400 amp breaker, you need a 400 amp wire. Easy enough. Number three, the overcurrent device that they terminate to on their load has to be part of a disconnect, and that disconnect has to be installed nearest the point of entrance to the building or structure. You know, that's already a requirement. 225.32 says, look, man, you supply a building with electricity, the disconnect has to be at the point of entrance. So that's already a rule. So really, it's not that hard. You know, what, what do we have to do? Protect them from damage and terminate the wires at their impacity.
that's it. So for example, and here's where you're gonna see this a lot. So why do I have this picture? Because this is student housing at a campus. University of Utah right there, go Utes. So at a campus style wiring system, it's usually common practice to buy your power at like 150,000 volts, 138 or something from the utility. And then you've got a customer owned substation and you've got, you know, could be hundreds of customer owned transformers all over the place. Your whole world is this rule, outside secondary conductors of unlimited length. So my building disconnect is rated 400 amps, right? I got a 400 amp, what we might call a service, but it's not a service. You know, we got a 400 amp feed to the building. Then we just need what? 400 amp rated wire. Not 380 amp wire, 400 amp wire. So secondary conductors that are outside, nice and easy. The last one is secondary conductors up to 25 feet in length. For secondary conductors that are longer than 10 feet and aren't outdoors, but are less than 25 feet, then here's the rule. They have to have an ampacity not less than the primary to secondary voltage ratio times one third the rating of the primary device. We'll get there, I promise. They have to terminate to an overcurrent device rated no higher than the conductor ampacity and be protected against physical damage. Let's look at the photograph. I've got my primary feeding the transformer, my secondary comes out longer than 10 feet, but not longer than 25, so I gotta deal with this rule. It's in a conduit, so we've got the protection from physical damage licked. It's feeding a 600 amp breaker, so I need a 600 amp conductor, right? Easy enough. Let's talk about this whole ampacity not less than the primary to secondary voltage ratio times one third the rating of the overcurrent device. Here's where you're gonna have a problem with this in the real world. One transformer, multiple sets of secondaries. I've got one 300 kVA transformer and it feeds four separate 225 amp panels. Could I do that? Yeah, of course, why not? I can absolutely do that. So 300 kVA, it's 480 to 208 with 400 amp primary overcurrent device, and, and that matters, we're gonna need that, right? So I, I went through and I did the whole rigmarole, 450.3B and currents of nine amps or more and 125% and all of this stuff, and I figured out, okay, I'm gonna use a 400 amp breaker to protect this. And then I've got four of these feeding the panels. Me as an inspector, you as a designer or electrician, if, if that's what you do. The second you see more than one secondary leaving the panel, leaving the transformer, that's when this calculation comes in. So the conductors have to be rated not less than the primary to secondary voltage ratio. Okay, this is 480 to 208. It's not the turns ratio, it's the voltage ratio. Okay, so 480 divided by 208. That gives me a primary to secondary voltage ratio of 2.3. Okay, so I write that number okay, 2.3. So what was it? Capacity not less than primary to secondary voltage ratio, 2.3, times one third the rating of the primary overcurrent device. Okay, cool, it was a 400 amp breaker that supplied it. So 400 amps divided by three is 133 amps. So I take my 2.3 voltage ratio times 133, which was one third the rating of the primary device. And that gives me 306 amps. What that means is every one of those transformer secondaries has to be rated at least 306 amps. I know it's going to a 225 amp breaker. That doesn't matter. They have to all be sized at least 306 amps because of this rule. This could come up if you had multiple sets going off the 10 foot rule, but it would be really hard to violate because instead of one third, it's one tenth. On the 25 foot though, it's one third, and that can end up biting you. Oh, we made it through transformers. I love talking about transformers. Just kind of one of those things I like. Guys, I hope you got something out of this. Let me open up the old Facebook chat and uh, see if there's anything happening. I wonder if, uh, wonder if my video stopped working two hours ago. Where would you typically install secondary protection for the transformer? It would be the it would be the the main breaker for the panel, Ben. That's where you would do it. Richard, you're drawing a line in the code book. Good man. Bob, thumbs up. Thanks. Okay. Um, 
I think everybody is happy. Got any questions before we uh, shut this down? Okay. Well, I'm going to shut it down. I hope you guys got something out of it. And I uh, hope you guys have a great day.